Hello everyone and thanks for joining School of the American Rifle. Today we're going to do a physical on a Brownells Proto. This is a early reproduction of the first AR-15. Brownells reproduced these for a couple years. I believe they may be discontinued now. At least they should have discontinued on their website. It may just be because of the current climate and they may resume things. So I'm not speaking with any authority there, but we got our hands on one from a dealer. This is not direct from Brownells. Um, so this isn't a cherry-picked model. We're going to go ahead and get this cracked open. Uh, it comes in a cardboard box. The Proto has a 25-round magazine, which is a copy of the original one. Um, if you've taken a look at the uh, Vickers uh, AR-15 book, it talks about the early prototype magazines. Pretty neat that Brown has reproduced this. It comes with a retro manual. I won't bore you with that. And then I did have to book it. So and it comes with oh, one of the operation and prevent, uh, preventative maintenance comics. Pretty neat. out of the bag. Yeah, this worked right away. It's a little different from what you normally see. The early models had a uh, charging handle inside of the carry handle. See in the back here, there's nothing to grab. There were different uh, features on it. One is it has a, uh, a non-captured front pivot pin. So it uses ball bearings to hold this in place so it's not captured. You can actually take that entire pin assembly out. There's no forward assist, no shell deflector. The furniture has no trap door. Like I said, if you check out the uh, the Vickers AR-15 book, the, the original one actually has like a, a leather slip over pad. The sights were a little bit different from this, but Brownhouse did a pretty good job of trying to capture the essence of the original prototype. So we're going to go ahead and do a physical. We've not done a physical on an entire rifle before in any of our videos. So I figured uh, such a neat gun. We'll go ahead and get this uh, a crack and see what we find out. Before we get into doing the physical though, I um, wanted to let the camera lady know that this is actually her Christmas present. What? So she thought that these were neat and uh, I hunted one down and this is hers. So, Merry Christmas, sweetheart. So we're going to see if I bought her a pile of junk or if it's good or not. So we're going to pause the video and we're going to get this up on the bench. Alright, we're back at it. We have this out on the tray as uh, Steve1989 would say. Let's make sure that it is safe. Chamber's clear. It did have a flag in it, but I'm just going to double check. We're going to open this up. Let's see how hard it is to get that front pivot pin out of place. That came out pretty easy, but see it's not captured. It just has a little ball bearing detent. And that's how the originals, uh, the prototypes were, and that's how the Colt 601s or Armor Light 601s were. Alright, here's our little receiver. Let's start checking stuff out. So first thing we're going to do is take a look at the buffer assembly. And I'm going to mash my thumb. For assembly out. Spring looks good. Let's measure it. We're going to lay it up next to the yardstick. And we're at 12 and a half. Our length should be between 11 and 3 quarter and 13 and a half. So we're good. Buffer is a modern type. The roll pin's not sticking out though. Pad has good density to it. It's not too soft. The early guns had a buffer that looked much different than this. Um, it was close to what the Edgewater buffers look like, um, but still not an Edgewater buffer. Alright, they have their own furniture. It's a uh, brown in color. I think that the original ones had like a, a speckle paint finish or they may have been fiberglass. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the low receiver. First thing I'm going to do is take the bolt carrier. We're going to use that as a gauge. You guys are going to get some sneak peeks of stuff that I only show in classes. Take a complete bolt carrier and lay it on the edge of the bolt catch. 
If it sustains the weight, the spring's good. You don't want it to do that. That's bad. That's good. All right. All right, now that uh, we've measured the buffer assembly, let's put it back into the lower. We have good contact with the retainer and the receiver extension. Let's do our bolt carrier travel test. Get the bolt carrier, push it all the way in, and oops, look, we're a little bit close here. Let's take our gauge. This is, should be the thickness of two quarters, and look, it doesn't fit. So this particular gun, it may be fine shooting it like this, but if we were to screw a sound suppressor on here or shoot some really hot ammo, this could strike there. So what we're going to do here to fix this is we're going to take the buffer out and we're going to drop a quarter into that tube. It'll be a nice fix. Um, these are from the 19, uh, late 1950s, the originals, so maybe I'll try to find a quarter from the 50s if it's not collectible and drop it in there. But that will be the fix for it. So. Receiver extension was drilled a little bit too deep for this example. All right, so let's check the pivot holes. Rear one takes the go, front one takes the go. Does not take the no go. We can go on both sides on this one because it's not captured and that passes. So pivot pins pass. Let's check with the magwell gauge. It passes. A little tight at the top, but it passes. All right, sides of the lower receiver. Nice and even on both walls here. We are a little bit thicker over here than over here, but we're not offset massively in the fire control pocket here. Let's do a safety check. Put it on safe. Match the trigger, put it on fire. We're gonna do a reset, let it go slow. Fire. Cock it again, let it go fast, and it held both ways, so we're good. The trigger feels pretty good. Let's go ahead and punch this fire control group out. There goes the hammer. There goes the disconnect. Just throwing parts everywhere today. All right, got our trigger out, got our disconnect out, got our hammer out. Set this off to the side. Our trigger spring here look good. They're parallel. Hammer spring looks good. Straight in line. Looks like they're using Schmidt Fire Control Group. Let's check it out with gauges. They all pass. Did I do with the other pin? Did I drop it somewhere? We're missing one of the trigger pins. I'm going to pause the video real quick and try to find it. We found the pin. It was right there. I don't know how I put it back into the lower. There it is, though. All right, so let's check out the holes in the lower receiver. Doesn't take the rejects. Go gauge goes in, has a little bit of slop, so I'd say those pinholes with my finely calibrated hand and eye are probably right around 0.156. Selector doesn't have any slop in it, so I'm not worried about that. Nice crisp engagement. Magazine catch feels good. It's threading it a little bit far for my taste, so we could turn that out one turn. We're still good there. Let's check the recess here in the front and in the rear. We pass. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'll use this gauge here and actually lay it into the lower and try to close the upper receiver to see if it'll close. If it closes on this gauge right here, this is 0 0.020. That means that there's too much slop either here or the rear lug there is too narrow. So again, a recipe. It's not what this measures out and what that measures out. It's what these two measure out when they're assembled. Same thing for the front. This should not go in between there. And also, when your upper is attached to the lower, you shouldn't be able to get an O2O 2 in between those two areas. It's not going to go in there, so we're good. 
All right, let's get our fire control group back together. Let's see if I can get this together without looking stupid on camera. Line that up. I'm not using a slave again. Let's see if I can get it together without a slave. And it did. Hammer. I may have done that before. You don't want to dry fire like I just did either. It can smash into your bolt catch, possibly break that, depending on the geometry of the hammer. So you can see how the hammer hits it. So if you were to dry fire that repeatedly, it could break your bolt catch. I've never seen a, uh, a forged lower receiver break right here, but some hammers do actually make contact with the lower if you dry fire it. Um, I have seen cast and magnesium lower break and plastic lower break, but I've never seen a forged lower receiver break. So. Everything on this lower receiver checks out. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this aside and we're going to get into the upper receiver now. Let's get our pivot pin out of the way. All right, I'm going to put the bolt carrier off to the side. My wife will have to remind me to grab that because I'll forget that it's there. We're going to start on the upper receiver and see what we can find. So we have our bore scope fired up. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take our charging handle out. This one comes out the same way a regular charging handle does, but instead of it having the tabs here, it has the charging handle trigger. So that rocks out. There's our charging handle. That's these little spring-loaded detents right here keep it in place because we don't have a groove machined into this side like a regular upper dust for the claw on the charging handle to grab it. So this could be a wear item. The traditional check that I do for regular uppers wouldn't work in the situation here. All right, let's check out the feed ramps. This particular upper should not have um, M4 ramps. It should have standard rifle ramps. Let me grab a flashlight. Take a look at the ramps in here. We can see some copper marks in here. Grab a swab. I don't feel anything rough in there. My wife might be having a difficult time getting the right angle, but things do look good. This appears to have a chrome line chamber. All right. Let's start checking out some things with the gauges. Forgot to lay out my barrel straightness gauge. So let me pull that out. We're going to put this into the chamber area. Drop it through. When it came out of the muzzle, barrel is straight. Now what I'm going to do, this is a cool little gauge that Black Rifle Disease Engineering made for me. He has separate rods of various lengths. This one is to check for a rifle length gas system. He has one for mid-length and one for carbine length. But what's neat about it is you put this punch in here. And one of the issues that I see with a lot of upper receivers with a fixed carry handle or a removable carry handle, but a fixed front sight base is this is crooked. So what we're going to do is lay this into the charging handle. I'm sorry, not the charging handle, the carry handle slot. And we're going to try to see if this thing has a straight front sight base. So let me work, walk this out a little bit more. And if you'll notice, we are slightly off. Can you see it's not pointed right? So this thing does catch a lot of guns that have problems like this. So let's rotate it and see if it changes position. But we are off a little bit. But this is a rather common issue that I see. So not a deal breaker, um, but you can have an issue with your windage if you can't hit target. So in this circumstance, what I would do here, and we're pretty good there. We have a little bit of slop here. Maybe it's the opening in this carry handle. But look. 
I can move it towards the center. So we may not be able to use this particular gauge for this upper. I can grab some shim material and we can see if we can square it up. So let me try to shim it real quick. We'll be right back to the camera. Help if I got if I got the right rod. I was using the one in the middle here. It was too short. I'm supposed to be using this one. So when you put it together the right way, now we can get full engagement on the carry handle here. See, now it's got no wobble. Very good. Let's take a look here. Let's see what we get. We can see we're still a little bit off. Not a bunch. See if I can get this to focus. There we go. See where it's pointing? We want it to point like that, but we're off like that. So sometimes when the barrel nut's tightened, if there's enough slop in the index pin on the upper receiver underneath of the barrel nut, the assembly can shift a little bit. Sometimes this is just pinned in the wrong position. So I'm not sure if these are taper pins that hold this on. It looks like they might be, but I could always fit this for oversized taper pins. So I could take this front sight, take the pins out, adjust it to where I want it, and then put oversized holes in there. Everything would line up. This is a rather common issue, but it's not something I'm going to correct unless we run out of windage when we try to zero with the iron sights. And this isn't going to get a fancy scope or anything like that because it just wouldn't be right. All right, so let's do muzzle erosion. We don't have full access to the muzzle here because we have our flash hider installed. So what we have to do is visualize where the threads end, right about there. So we're gonna put the gauge in, nice and careful like, and on some new barrels you can't even get the gauge started because when they machine the crown, there's a burr, but it went in. Now what we're gonna do is put my finger where I think the gauge should go. We're going to extract the gauge, and look, we're at a one on erosion. So, front end of the barrel, good. All right, now we're going to measure the throat. We're going to use a throat erosion gauge. This is just going to see where we're at with a fresh or virgin barrel. I'm going to see how many lines I can count out of 11. I can 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this has a 2 for erosion, which is pretty typical. No two barrels measure exactly the same. Next, what we're going to do is actually see if the throat, even though we measured for erosion, we're going to see what the right angle is. This barrel, I don't know if they have it marked, should be a 5.56, five, and I do. I see it under here. Let me see if I can get it lit up. 5.56 by 45. It's in that hole there. NATO. Looks like it says chrome bore, 1 in 12. I may be wrong here, uh, but I think the original prototypes and the 601s up to a certain uh, number actually had a 1 in 14 twist barrel, but that's fine. This is not a, uh, a truly 100% accurate reproduction. This is a shooter. It's a neat gun. All right, so 1 in 12. It is chrome lined. But it is a NATO marked barrel. So this gauge right here is made by Michigan's. We should be able to put this in. This is measuring just the throat. Put this in and we're going to go straight up and down with this. So the way that I test with this gauge is I tap this like you're trying to get someone's attention on their shoulder. Tap, tap, tap. And I'm going to grab this and try to pick the upper receiver up. And see how it came out? If the upper receiver, now let me push it in hard just to show you what would be if it failed. And it cut loose there. But basically, you just want to tap, 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 and it should break free. And that tells me that the taper right here, the throat, is acceptable to be considered truly 5.56. A lot of barrels are marked. Marked 5.56, they're not. What makes the difference is not just the throat length and taper, but also the headspace spec. This thing should close on a 14646 headspace gauge, which is, again, something that I forgot. Let me go grab them.
We have the gauges. Let's grab our bolt carrier. And let's see what we get. Let's skip right to the 14646. So let's see if it'll take it. We'll drop that in there. Extend our bolt head. Remember, my gauges are modified. Normally, you would have to take the ejector and extractor out of your bolt to test it with commercial gauges. And it closes. Very good. That's going to give me hell opening it up because we don't have our charging handle in place. So here is what I do when I have silly moments like that. Brass punch right on the area where the auto sear would trip. And knock it open. So it passes headspace. That was tight enough where I don't have to measure with the field gauge that I'm going to anyway. So let's put our field gauge in. There's our red stripe. Put our bolt carrier in. We're going to go straight up and down with this. See that won't seat, so it won't close on the field gauge. That's good. So it passes headspace, passes throat, passes muzzle erosion, passes straightness. All right, so upper receiver, we have a slightly canted front sight base or barrel. Everything else so far has been fantastic. Let's check to see if our gas tube is aligned properly. So what we're going to do is strip our bolt carrier down. Bit of oil on it. We're going to use our bolt carrier as a gauge. Put this into the upper receiver. We want to see at a 45 degree angle whether or not the bolt carrier will drop under its own weight. If it doesn't, that means that the gas tube is positioned improperly. It's off left, right, up, down, and it can wear the little flared portion down. We don't want that. So I'll do it at a 45 degree angle. Make sure nothing binds. I'll try it both ways, and then I'll go straight up and down with it and drop it. Make sure I get no resistance. It shouldn't stop like right here. It should go all the way down under its own weight. So upper receiver passes. Before we consider everything done though, let's take a look inside with the bore scope and see what we can detect. So I'm going to grab this and device like so. I don't want to grab this hard. These are plastic hand guards. It does have aluminum heat shields in it. This is not going to work so let me grab a Midwest URR. Before we look at it with the bore scope, I am going to punch through with a cleaning pack. So let me grab one over here. Make sure that our barrel is clean. And it probably has some fouling in there from testing and from storage preservatives, and it did. Nothing wrong with that. Pretty interesting here on the muzzle device. They're using one of the original split style washers. You don't see that anymore. Nice little touch. All right, let's get this into the URR. Let's see if it fits. Does. Missing one of my tools, I'm going to try to locate it real quick. I 
I use the Midwest URR for pretty much all of my upper receiver work. One of the problems, and this one's so shiny, some upper receivers, the inner bore is undersized. So for this particular one, to work with those types of uppers, I actually took the self and I turned it down. So this is my undersized one. But when you use these a lot, the lugs up here can get a little bit peened over. So I keep one that is essentially my gauge. So the edges here, they're not peeled over or peened up. This is my gauge. This will tell me whether or not the barrel extension is clocked in the upper receiver. So I'm going to use that in here right now to see if it passes. These lugs should go into there. Look at that. Beautiful. Nice and clean. No resistance. If it were to stop right there, that means that either the upper receiver has something wrong with it or the barrel extension has something wrong with it. It's good to see though. So let's get our barrel into here so we can take a look with the bore scope. All right. Let's fire up the bore scope. Get our light. And into the front we go. All right. I'm going to move this out of the way. Let's look at our crown. Crown looks good. Here's our rifling. Rifling looks pretty good, nice and crisp. You can see a little bit of delaminization of the chrome right there, which is pretty standard. Even on brand new barrels, it happens. That may go away when we clean it though, it could just be some fouling. It looks like it's chrome that's detaching. It might not be though. I'm try to change the light output on here. Now it's in strobe mode. There we go. Change the focus. There we go. bit of defect here in the barrel. Again, pretty normal for just a blaster. This is not a precision rifle, so this barrel looks good for that application. So let me pull the bore scope out and I'm going to try to see if we can detect our gas port. All right, right about here. Back in we go. We're going to try to see if our gas system is lined up and take a look at how much erosion this has at the gas port. We're approaching it right now based on this. Look at that. So see that erosion right there? This gun has seen a little bit of use. I don't think this is brand new. I think that this gun has probably had a little bit more than just testing ran through it. If I had to guess based on the erosion you see right there, there's been probably at least uh, 50, 60 rounds, if not a couple hundred through this gun. Could be wrong, but I think that's what's going on here. Now I'm going to look up into the gas port. You can see that little bright glimmer of light right there. Let me change the focus. And that is the arch of our gas tube. So we do have an aligned gas system. We're good there. But this is definitely not a new in-box gun. It may have been test fired at the shop that had it. Definitely not brand new, so we have some more wear on the rifling. Those things might clear up. Overall, not bad. Let's go look at the chamber. And I ran out of I ran out of bore scope. So let's flip this around and we'll go back in from the back side. This is in front of our throat. That is the throat area right there that we measured. It did measure out to be 5.56. Five, this is our neck and our chamber. The chamber looks pretty rough. Let me change the focus a little bit. If 
Chamber's a little rough. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to check dimensions of the chamber. Now that I'm seeing this is a little rough, I wanted to check this anyway. The chrome's a little rough in there. Again, not a deal breaker. The neck area right there is pretty nasty looking, but again, not a deal breaker. It could just be preservatives from the oils that were put in it, so it needs to have a good cleaning in the barrel, and then I'll revisit that. I'm thinking that's not pitting. I'm thinking that's just dried oil. It looks like it's on the surface there. So it looks worse on camera than it probably is. I'm not saying that because it's our gun or Donna's gun. All right, so what we're going to do now is check throat dimensions before we consider this a success or a failure. So I have these chamber function gauges. This is a 556 marked barrel, so I'm going to grab the 556 marked function gauge. This is the 223 wild. I don't want to use that one. Here's the 556. So what this does is this checks the, the throat area, the neck, shoulder, and the diameter of the chamber. Headspace gauges will not tell you whether or not the diameter of the chamber is right. It only measures from this point to the bolt face. So you can have an undersized chamber and still pass headspace. So what we do is we put this in here, and it's a little bit more difficult when the barrel is assembled into the gun. And I'm going to push this in with a little bit of force, see if I can pull it out. A little bit of force, and it should just come out with no resistance, and it does. So the chamber dimensions on this are spot on. So we have a little bit of oddity going on in the barrel. What I'm going to do is we're not going to stop and clean the barrel and come back to it. But what I will make a note in the description is I'm going to put some bore cleaner in here, let it sit. And if I do note that this is some corrosion going on or some um, delaminization that's going on with the chrome, I'll note that in the description. I do believe that most of what we see, though, is just bore preservatives, some type of oil that dried in there. This barrel has definitely seen some use, though, based on the gas port erosion. Not a big deal in my opinion because we were going to shoot this anyway. Um, but not truly a perfectly new barrel or one that was just basically test fired. Alright, so let's put that off to the side. And we're going to deal with the bolt carrier. Well, we do have our magazine. I could check this with a gauge. Look, we got some preservative on there too. It's like all sticky. Like it's almost like glue. Let me get some acetone, wipe it off. This is one of the things that is smart to do before you take a new gun out, regardless of who makes it, because a lot of manufacturers will put things like this on here to prevent corrosion. Look at all of it. And I would rather have something all gooped up like this than to have it all rusted up. preservative off of it. That's probably on the inside of the magazine too. So what I'll do after the video is over, again, I'll go ahead and take this magazine apart. I'll spray some degreaser inside of there and I'll get all of that preservative out of the inside. You don't want that causing the follower to bind up because it's sticky, all gummed up. Alright, so magazine looks good. Let me get a magazine gauge just to check it. All right, we had camera problems again. Battery died. Sorry. Um, we're going to gauge our magazine out. This is a Brownells copy of a U.S. government issue magazine gauge. This goes right down on the spine of the magazine and comes down. You got to push the follower down. It comes down and it measures how wide the gap is for the feed lips. This thing has a taper to it. I don't know if it's easy to see on the video, but right there on the front, it's tapered. So if it starts here, it's okay, but if it goes all the way down, it's bad. And it almost goes all the way down. So this particular magazine may have feeding problems. We'll find out when we live fire it. But I may need to tweak these lips inward a little bit. And there's actually a tool that's made for that. It grabs those, those lips um, and doesn't 
pain them or bend them or damage them. So, but it does eat the no-go gauge. So, Suspect magazine, but this is more of a collectible. Almost hurt myself there. More of a collectible than anything because it's a copy of the original 25 rounder. All right, let's get into the bolt carrier. We already checked head space. Let's get our extractor out. They have no insert, and they put the donut. The donut would not have been used back then. Um, I do have an early Colt 601 bolt carrier, and they had a white insert right in there. This one has no insert. So again, it's not a 100% copy, but people that are collectors are more focused on things like that. So it passes the extractor gauge. Go goes in, no go doesn't. Pacific Tool and Gauge actually has a pre-order available on these now. If you go on their website, they'll have them listed. I believe it's just an extractor gauge is what they're marketing as. They go for right around 125 um, so these have not been available for several years now, but enough of uh, you guys and gals have uh, have knocked on their door long enough saying, hey, will you make this again? And they've just uh, decided to start making them again. So passes the extractor gauge. Claw feels good. Moves freely on the pin. Set that aside. Let's check the bolt face opening. Takes the gauge. Passes there. Let's check the firing pin hole. Takes the go side. No go side doesn't go in. The ejector has a nice rounded edge. I'm going to check it with a punch. Make sure that it has sufficient tension. I will check that off camera. Good spring in there. All right, let's check our bolt tail. Oh, look at that. Brand new, and it takes the no go. The field it does not take. So what this means is this went in here. That means that this dimension was a little bit undersized. So this bolt is a little bit gas inefficient. So not a big deal as long as the gun produces enough gas in the gas system to overcome that inefficiency there. So that's only one variable. We still have to measure the inside of the carrier. And again, it's a recipe. How this interfaces with the hole in there is what matters, not just what that dimension is. So if this eat eats this gauge, it's about 001 undersized in the grand scheme of things. But if it takes one of these green gauges, it's equal to most bolt carrier groups that we do physicals on that go into the yellow range. So not a deal breaker, but we'll see. All right, let's do our gas ring test. Supports the gas rings, we're good. Gas rings look good. Bolt looks good, they laser engraved at MP. Overall finish on it's pretty good. The bolt carrier has no notches for the forward assist. The staking is the modern type. The older ones would have had stakes there and there. Let me grab my punch and show you. Here and here. Alright, so everything on the bolt so far is good. Let's do our cam pin opening. That's good. Let me grab the cam pin, check for wobble. It's got a good fit there. Got a little bit of a groove that's in there from testing. There's a possible couple hundred rounds in there. Got a little bit of a groove there. I can catch it with my finger now, but not a failure. All right, so bolt is good. Now we need to do firing pin protrusion and measure our bolt shoulder. Check for magnetism. Oh, almost got that. Oh, yep, look at that. Magnetic firing pin. Let's see if our bolt's magnetic. Oh, firing pin is though, so let's demagnetize that. I gotta move my laptop out of the way because I do not want this thing to kill my laptop. We go. We fixed it. 
All right, let's do our bolt shoulder. This raised up area right there. Five two seven, a little bit on the small side. I prefer to see five two eight. All right, so bolt passes. We did have some magnetism there, but we fixed it. Extractor's good. We do have this donut here. I'm probably going to get rid of this assembly and put a um, a white insert in there. These should have a solid firing pin retaining pin too, instead of the standard type that are used now. I'm actually more of a fan of these, but we'll try to make it a little bit more historically accurate. All right, now let's get into our firing pin protrusion, and then we can move on to the carrier. Protrusion is 0315, 0315, 0315. So firing pin protrusion is right almost dead center. 032 is about dead center. 0 0.028 to 0 0.036 is the number we're looking for. I need to grab an upper receiver real quick. Check and see if our gas key is aligned. And it is. Let's measure the length of our carrier. Six, six, eight. Very good. Don't want six six six. Mama says it's the devil. Takes the green. Does not take the red. We're good there. All right. Let's start checking the gauntlet. First green. Second green. First yellow. All right, so we have a slightly loose interface here between the bolt support shoulder and in here, so that means the bolt has a little bit of slot. That's nothing to do with the gassing then. Let's take our gas ring run. First green, second green, yellow, doesn't go into the red, so slightly inefficient for the gas ring run. Again, not a deal breaker. Let's check the back side now. Takes the first green, second green, and it won't take the yellow. So this is good. Going back to what I was talking about, this tail here is a little bit undersized, but this measurement here, the hole that this interface is with, is still on the efficient side. So if this thing had not gone into this gauge, we could have a carrier that had a measurement that took this, and it will be about the same as what we see here. So again, not a complete failure, but slightly inefficient as far as that dimension goes. We'll keep an eye on it. Worst case scenario is we would have to slightly oversize the gas port in the barrel, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. We'll find out when we do live test fire. So last check is going to be for our gas key bolts. We're going to do a reverse torque check and then we're going to do a bore scope inspection and see if we see anything on the inside of this carrier that throws up any flags. Set our wrench to 30 inch pounds. Come over to the vise. And let's see what we get. Pass. Pass. All right. Let me clean the inside of this carry real quick with a swab, and then we'll get looking at it with a bore scope. Just with the naked eye, it looks not too bad. It doesn't look like it's the smoothest carrier in existence, but if you look at some of the older machining on early Armalite and Colt guns, most people would freak out if they saw it today in their gun. Let me grab one real quick.
There's an early carrier right here. Solid firing pin retaining pin. Fat firing pin in there. Stake in on the top. Look how rough everything is on the sides here. Bolts the same way. Everything looks pretty rough. The sides of the lugs, I mean, those aren't really working surfaces. But again, night and day when you compare them side to side. But this was good for the technology they were using. All right, so let's take a look with the bore scope and see what we find. In we go. I need to make myself a little fixture for this so I'm not moving around too much for the camera. Not too bad. It's a little bit of oil right there that I didn't get out. The gas ring runs a little rough here, see? So this particular bolt carrier may eat the gas rings a little faster until it wears in. And let's check the bolt tail run, see what we're looking at on the inside. There's our bolt tail run. Let me change the focus. It's a little rough. Looks like where the chrome didn't quite grab onto the surface and it's separating. Not bad, not great, but as they say with some food that's not perfect, it'll make a turd. <laughs> My wife thinks that's disgusting, so we'll leave that in the video. <laughs> All right, so. Overall, the gun did very well. Um, we have a slightly inefficient bolt tail. Um, everything passed. We had a magnetic firing pin that we fixed. So I will remedy this uh, odd extractor arrangement that I'm not a fan of. Um, beyond that, we have a slightly inefficient bolt carrier, which should run. If it doesn't, then it means, means we need to open up the gas system a little bit. That's a last resort. I don't just go opening up barrels. Um, let me get the upper and lower back on the table. The lower receiver passed with flying colors. Let me move this bore scope out of the way. Oh, my wife's going to grab it. Lower receiver passed with flying colors. Upper receiver did extremely well. Our only thing was we had a slightly canted front sight base. That's fine over there. Um, overall, really happy with this. Um, I was worried that it was going to be um, a severe pile of junk, and I gave my wife a present that was just terrible. Uh, but it did well. Um, nothing that I can't fix. I think it's going to be just fine. We're going to do some live fire testing in the trap here just to see if we can pick up any little uh, odd things going on. But pretty neat little gun. I hope Brownall starts making them again because I think they're a great addition to the market. People that can't afford to get into um, some of the early model retros. I mean, these, these parts, this really doesn't exist in the collectible market for the original prototype gun. But even like things like the early 601s and 602s, you can go on GunBroker and look at what some of these parts go for. Um, you're talking three and four thousand dollars for a parts kit to build a clone gun for an early um, M16 or 601, 602 clone, things like that. So pretty neat that Brownells tip uh, dipped their toe into the water here. Um, my wife thought that these were neat guns, and I wanted to get her one. So uh, we'll put this back together. And get one final look at it. That's the seat. Move that out of the way. We'll get this back together. I'm sure some of you guys watching that have been in the service could probably do this blindfolded. Maybe I could. I'm sure you guys could do it better though.
little dry, but we'll get it greased up. Yep, the sotaracha, as people are calling it. Do not eat that. That's lubricant. All right, so hope you all found this video educational, and thanks for watching.